with and be able to kind of walk the walk and talk the talk. So what I'm going to do today is kind of delve into five different areas of a cultural institution's insurance program that aren't necessarily part of the usual package. It might be something that you know, a museum might have um, and not really think a whole lot about or might not have but have that exposure. And, or um, you have it and you don't really understand a whole lot about it. So this isn't going to be about property. It's not going to really be about general liability. It's going to be about five pretty specific subsets of uh, a program and then how it relates to your museum exposure and if it makes sense to either have these types of things um, or if you can sort of risk manage them away. And you know, there's that great chat feature. So if there is a specific question about what I'm talking about, uh, Heather's going to ping me and interrupt me. And if there are more general questions, you can leave them to the end. Or uh, my contact info will be at the end. And you can reach me after this, and we can talk more about it. So me personally, um, I do have a, a law degree from Boston College. Um, and right now, I'm currently working towards my certified risk management designation, which is, you know, insurance industry, we have a lot of designations. Um, and I, I consider risk management one to be one of the more useful ones. So uh, I'm almost done with that. So that will help me kind of advise our clientele outside of just buying insurance and, you know, what are some things you can do that might not necessarily cost money to help manage your risk. Um, so I really enjoy the museums because a lot of you, while we kind of generalize museums and cultural institutions, you are all very different, and you all have very different things that you do. So that being said, uh, we'll get kind of into what, what are some things that set you all apart that you might need one of these uh, five different things that I'm going to go into. But I will do a disclaimer. Um, unless you're my client currently and you're attending this, uh, this chat, the things I'm going to talk about are just general. So please don't uh, make any decisions based on what I say. If you would like to talk further about your program, you're welcome to do that. But this is just for informational purposes only. So I have to put that disclaimer in there, though. All right, so the first, as a nonprofit, almost everyone uses volunteers. Uh, it helps you get your work done. I know one of the NEMA presentations uh, this past year was about you know, your heavy reliance on a very small staff, so I'm assuming that most of you use volunteers to, to just make it through the day and, and to meet your goals. So that being said, um, what kind of things are your volunteers doing? And what does your volunteer base look like? And if something were to happen to them, how are you going to protect them and take care of them? So, Part of a, a standard package policy, and when I say package, I mean property, general liability, um, and sometimes workers' compensation, auto, that forms like your core insurance policy for most nonprofits. And under your general liability, there's typically uh, a coverage called medical payments, and that's a no-fault coverage. Uh, that's usually just a way to get something that happens on your premises to go away. So whether a visitor slips and falls, uh, someone uh, gets, a, gets a sprained ankle because they, they trip down the steps, um, my, very minor injuries, this is, this is what an insurance program, the general liability part of an insurance program kind of contemplates, making sure these things don't turn into a lawsuit. So basically, if you, if you have someone that comes up to you and says, you know, I, I bumped my head into this sharp corner that wasn't protected. I have to go and get five stitches. It's costing me $5,000 in an ER visit. What are you going to do about it? This is a way you can kind of make it go away and make everyone happy. So that's more geared towards your visitors and your patrons. Some insurance policies will allow these medical payments to extend to your volunteers. Um, but I'd say half the time that I've seen with our clients, uh, volunteers are excluded. So typically medical payments are anywhere from like $5,000 to $20,000 limit. And that's, like I said, usually enough to make the small things go away. So let's say your volunteers are excluded and we have a volunteer that gets hurt on your premises. So this is a real life claim scenario. This actually happened 
um, an older volunteer was doing some gardening at one of our historic home museums and tripped and fell. Um, it was a sunny day, it wasn't raining, nothing out of the ordinary, and they ended up needing a hip replacement. So that was all said and done, it was about $300,000 worth of medical bills. So the volunteer did come to the museum, asked if what they were going to do about it, and they said, we don't have, what can we do about it? And we did tell them that there was a volunteer exclusion on the general liability policy, um, and it ended up morphing into a lawsuit. So this is uh, something that everyone should be aware of, um, and at least if it's excluded, what to do about it, and that's the next slide, is uh, consider purchasing a volunteer accident and sickness policy. And I have a, a bad bullet in there that workers' compensation does not cover volunteers, just as a quick aside. That's not 100% true. Um, it is true here in Connecticut, and I did some um, additional research, and in some cases, your volunteers can be covered under workers' compensation, so that is the case in Massachusetts. Um, in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Vermont, volunteers are excluded. And in Maine, volunteers are excluded, but an organization can opt to add them to their workers' compensation policy, which is really expensive to do. So um, a low-cost way to do this is to buy this volunteer accident and sickness policy, also called an accident medical policy. Um, it, pro it provides that no-fault coverage for injuries. It can be first dollar, meaning they'll pay the claim from the, the first expense incurred, or it can be excess to the volunteer's health care. You can add weekly indemnity, which is disability, to replace lost wages. If your volunteers are doing really physical things, that um, could take them away from their jobs that they have full time, and you're worried about that, you can um, add that disability coverage. It is, it does jack up the price of the premium. They'll probably double it. And um, the premium is usually based on the number of the active volunteers that you have. So most people, most clients that I meet with say they have hundreds of volunteers, but you really want to capture those that if you put a, a call out for help, how many will actually show up. Um, if not, you're going to pay a lot more. So um, the good thing about a volunteer accident and sickness policy is that it generates a lot of goodwill amongst your volunteer base. It makes them feel that you value them. It makes them feel more likely to help out with some of the more physical tasks. Um, and it's a really nice way to just, you know, if these things happen, and you know, Tom will get into the Affordable Care Act and, and what it kind of means for small employers, but you know, healthcare is such a gray area right now, and some people have these sky high deductibles. So, the less that someone has to go to their own healthcare is probably the better. So, um, try, I'm looking to see if there's any questions specifically about volunteer accident and sickness policies, but I don't see anything. And Heather, nope, you're good. Okay, we'll move on. And the goal of this is to do, um, you know, to go through these slides and to reserve pretty ample time for questions if we can. So. The next slide is, is liquor liability, which um, Heather indicated to me that a lot of people had questions about um, prior to this webinar, so I hope this clears some things up. Um, so most policies, most package policies will offer host liquor liability uh, for those organizations that aren't in the usual business of furnishing alcohol. So for most nonprofits, you aren't in the business of selling alcohol. Um, the exceptions are, you know, those veterans organizations that operate um, the, the uh, bars and um, meeting halls and things like that. That's kind of the only exception that I can think of. Um, so your host, you know, the, the odd special event, not like a gala or anything like that, like, really small, intimate things where you might be serving alcohol. Um, if you have a holiday party for your employees that's close to the public, your host liquor policy will cover that. Um, you want to offer some beverages during a board meeting, that's fine. Um, but it's becoming more of an issue that the package policies are excluding even host liquor because where we're the underwriters doing your renewal or you're going out to market, the underwriters will go on your social media pages and they will see what you are doing. 
So if you're routinely having events that you're offering alcohol for free or for a charge to the public, and it's it's not at a restaurant or it's not clear whether a bar a licensed bartender is serving it, underwriters are starting to put on that exclusion for host liquor. So you will have no liquor coverage if a claim comes from that. Sorry, I'm going to the next page. <clears throat> so the bottom line, um, review your policy if you are doing these events and to review your state statutes. Because the, uh, the level of liability that a state will, will put on an organization that has one of these claims, it, I mean, it varies. It could be strict liability. It, um, it could really depend on who started served the liquor first and if the guest was drinking prior to attending your event and then got hurt, you know, where does the liability lie? So really reading your statutes is, is kind of the best place to start and also your policy. Um, one of the exclusions <clears throat> if you, is uh, it's called Amendment of Liquor Liability Exclusion CG CAT uh, Goose 2150. And that will say if you have host liquor, but it, in a way if you charge for alcohol or if you need a license to sell alcohol. So that, I mean, that pretty much does away with almost any special event. So you know, want to see if you have that particular exclusion on your policy. Um, and <clears throat> if you do, my number one recommendation to most of our clients who do want to serve alcohol is to just transfer it away and host your event at a third party venue, whether it be a hotel, a restaurant, a bar, someone else who has a liquor liability policy because it's it, well, if you, there's a fatality involved, I mean, you're going to look at a judgment of million dollars at least. So it's, in my opinion, it's best to put those things to somebody else, someone who's in the business of doing so, someone who has bartenders who are TIPS certified. Um, but if you absolutely 100% want to have liquor and you want to sell it and you think it's going to be a great revenue stream, you really want to have your own liquor liability policy. Um, sometimes you can get added to the by the carrier you already have your insurance with. Sometimes the carriers, the nonprofit carriers, don't have this capability. You're going to have to go to another carrier. Um, they usually rate off of um, expected receipts for the year. So if you think you're going to make 20 grand from the liquor, that's what they're going to contemplate, and that's what the premium will be based off of. Um, one day event policies, in my opinion, unless it's it's really a great revenue stream, it's not really worth the money. Uh, having an event policy with liquor liability, the minimum I've seen is $800 for the day. So if you think your receipts will exceed that and then it'll be a profitable venture, then go ahead. But um, either that, I would say, if you're going to host several events a year, you want to do the alcohol, you want your people to serve it, it would be best just to get a liquor liability policy. And um, one question there I do have, it didn't happen at our firm, but there was an event at a library and the patron was drinking before and they fell down the steps when there was an open bar at this library fundraiser and they had severe, I think he was a quadriplegic after the fact. So he, of course, through the library and everyone, every other venue, vendor that was there, and the library did have a legal liability policy. So the settlement, that settlement was high six figures. So just something to think about. Um, liquor, for me, in my head, is a real mis risk management question, and you really need to weigh the financial benefit before kind of going down that road. Um, are there any questions about liquor? Kristen, I do have a question on that one because some of our previous um, presentations have been dealing with, you know, hosting events at their site and stuff like that. Do most, um, the caterers usually have that insurance. Does that kind of, would you want something in addition to what the caterer is holding um, for those type of events or kind of the caterer and the bartender um, usually have that type of insurance so they'll cover it? Yes, usually a good, reputable caterer and bartender will have their own insurance. And what you want to do is, 
if you're the organization that is hosting these, whether it's a wedding or um, some other kind of event, you're going to want a certificate of insurance from the from any vendor who comes on your property. Uh, so this isn't just liquor; just anyone who's who's installing things or doing work or uh, serving food. Um, you always want a certificate of insurance, and you always request that they name your organization as an additional insured under both their general liability and, if it's applicable, their um, liquor liability. So that's, that's a blanket statement, too. I mean, if you have people working on your roof, uh, if you have landscapers, snow, snow removal, snow plowing, anything like that, you always, always want a certificate, and you always want to ask if they'll name you as an additional insured. Sometimes they'll balk and say no, but I, we never do, as a matter of course. Um, that's just good kind of business practice to always do that. Um, but yes, that's a good question because I did have that note. Uh, certificates kind of reign supreme, and a lot of lawsuits will live and die on certificates and how people are named. So. Okay. Yeah, because that's just something that brought up quite a bit is that um, you know the caterers and bartenders. So I just wanted to make sure everybody's clear on that part of it. Yes, absolutely. And make sure your your bartenders, your caterers, that they are TIP certified. Um, and I have some risk management advice for those who do want to host their own uh, alcohol events. And, and the things to look for, and just really quick, is um, training your own people as TIP certified, which uh, various states have ways to do this. Um, avoid open bars. Control the serving types of drinks. Uh, consider the type of beverages you're going to be serving, wine and beer versus hard alcohol. Obviously, um, you know, hard alcohol can be more potent than the other two. Uh, control the number of t drinks a person can have at one time, so offer drink tickets. Uh, always close the bar at least one hour before the end of the event. Uh, serve food more than just you know, crudite and things like that, heavier hors d'oeuvres. Um, so that can help because I know alcohol can be a good money maker for organizations and you know luckily you can purchase liquor liability policies if you want to do it and you're large enough to think that you can um, make some money off of it but just know that one bad claim can kind of <clears throat> wipe out everything so I would definitely have liquor. Um, so I'll move on to um, not a very light topic, but an important one is um, having a sexual abuse and molestation policy. And this is especially important if you work with vulnerable populations. And vulnerable doesn't have to just mean children. Um, disabled populations, older adults in nursing homes, uh, school programs where, where your folks might be alone with other um, big groups of kids. Uh, so sometimes people just think kids, so don't just think that. <clears throat> um, so sexual abuse and molestation policy, they're sometimes called improper conduct policies or improper sexual conduct policies, and they're part of a general liability program. They are typically not added in for free. It almost always costs to add um, a level of coverage that I feel will be adequate. So sometimes I see like freebies, putting freebies in quotes, um, freebies of $100,000 worth of sexual abuse and molestation or $300,000. If you're working with um, these vulnerable populations, that's not going to be enough. In my opinion, I think um, if you do, you always want to get a million occurrence, three million aggregate to start, and we'll get into why. Um, so sexual abuse and molestation policies, they provide protection for the uh, insured's legal obligation to pay compensatory damages because of liability arising out of acts of sexual misconduct. Um, this also means negligent employment, negligent investigation, negligent supervision, um, lack of training or retention of or failing to report to the proper authorities a person who has committed um, an act of sexual misconduct. And this also can include negligent mishandling of a complaint arising from an act of sexual misconduct. So I, it, it's not just the act itself, it's kind of the things that stem from it as well. Um, if you have a summer camp, if you have a winter camp, if you have classes for kids, if you um, 
have programs where adults can drop them off and kids off or pick them up if you go into nursing homes or or maybe host um, groups of disabled populations and I'm not sure why they wouldn't have an aid with them but it you know any sort of I'd say any sort of situation you can think of where something like this could go wrong I would contemplate buying this product because uh, these judgments, when they are legitimate, uh, the, the settlement figures are high, uh, extremely high. So they're rare. I will say, I, you know, the claims that we see, we don't, we're not seeing them all over the place. But when they happen, um, they're in the, you know, hundreds of thousands or even um, millions of dollars to settle. And that's not to account for defense costs. So if you do have this coverage, like I said, it's on your general liability policy. Um, there are some things you want to think about uh, just to review with your agent. Um, are volunteers considered insured under the policy definition? Are they covered? Um, are your defense costs inside or outside limits? And this comes up in directors and officers too. Um, legal fees will eat away at any level of limit of insurance that you have. And if your defense costs are inside the limits, that means that any legal fees is going to take that, let's say you have a million dollars of coverage and you have $300,000 worth of legal fees, inside the limits uh, defense cost is going to take down that million dollars to 700000 And then that's all you have left for a settlement. So it sounds like a lot, but you know, lawyers these days, things are really expensive. Um, out, so you always want defense costs outside the limits if you can get it. Sometimes it's a little bit extra, but in my opinion, it's worth it. And you also want to uh, confirm if you have an umbrella policy if it sits over your sexual abuse and molestation product because this is not automatic. This is something you typically have to ask for. An underwriter is not just going to put an umbrella over that, um, but typically if you ask, they will or they'll give you a good reason why not. So the top bullet, even groundless claims, are tens of thousands of dollars to defend. I think we can all think of very prominent examples in the media of nonprofit organizations that have had these types of claims. Um, you know, it's hard to argue in a <laughs> if you have a, a jury of people and they, these horrific things that happen to them. I mean, they're not just going to you know give a little bit. They usually give a lot to these plaintiffs. Um, how much of the policy is usually the next question, and it's a hard thing to say. Um, they're typically rated off number of campers or students you have and how many camper days out of the year. So that how many days, um, how many hours and how many days out of the year are these people on your premises? And carriers aren't just going to quote it because you ask for it. You need to have certain standards in place that you can show them so they will be okay with giving you this coverage. So this includes very thorough background checks and that would run the federal, state, local, checking your sexual predator database, which is free, um, verifying employment references, verifying education, um, and even if you have teachers who are counselors in the summer, and even if they have li are licensed by the state or the county or what have you, you still need to go through these background checks with them. Even if they do it every single year and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. You don't want to leave yourself vulnerable to that. So always do your background checks. Um, there's a great website, Nonprofit Risk Management Center. They have um, a deal with, uh, I think, in Telesource where you can do a background check per person for $12 or something like that, which if you have a lot of counselors, yes, does sound like a lot, but it's worth it to do the exercise. And um, you also are going to have to have um, very comprehensive uh, policies in place about how you plan to prevent sexual abuse and molestation in your organization and also training. Um, and the risk, the nonprofit risk management center has some great resources um, for training that you, I believe you have to pay for and if you're with a certain carrier, uh, I believe Philadelphia, you might have access to those for free, but that's something to look into. Um, I won't really go too much into what an abuse and molestation policy covers. You can read that right there. But um, I will say on the last bullet point, enhancements to consider. 
innocent party defense coverages for employees and volunteers. Uh, I did some research before this as to, there's a lot out there about how much it costs to convict someone and the fees and the penalties and the fines and the, and the eventual settlement for people who did it, but it's harder to find statistics about people who actually didn't do it. Um, and there was um, some articles that I found about a, a few school teachers who were accused of abuse and molestation, and just the legal fees alone for one gentleman, I think were about 80000 um, And the school had to end up paying that back. Um, so that's something to think about. And also um, image and PR restoration. Um, there is some, some carriers offer this. Um, they also offer it on the cyber liability side, which is not something I'm going to get into today. but. Uh, if you do have this and it hits the media, there is a sublimit. Um, it's usually not a ton of money, maybe like 50000 or 100000 They will hire a PR agency for you and they will do everything they need to do to kind of mitigate the response in the media so your donor base doesn't just shrink overnight. Um, I haven't actually seen anyone use this enhancement, I'd be interested. I wouldn't know who the PR agency would be or how they handle that or what, but um, obviously I have a picture there of the Second Mile and that's the now defunct nonprofit um, that Jerry Sandusky from the Penn State scandal was uh, affiliated with, so that is no longer. Um, and I'm not sure if any image or PR restoration would have helped them, but at least it's there, especially if it's um, an allegation that's not true. So is there any questions about that? We actually had a comment um, from Noelle saying, um, if you're a nonprofit in Massachusetts, um, you can apply for a free CORI request to the CORI website, so there's no fee for the request. Um, okay. I'm not sure about, if, do you know about the other states or if anybody can pop in to say yes or no? I've heard Rhode Island has something too. Okay. We're a quiet and group I'd today. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. That's great info because we have a lot of um, a lot of clients in Massachusetts, and that's great. Because I know, I, you know, twelve dollars times so you have a big camp times twenty, I and mean, that's a lot of money. It starts um, to add up after time. Sure, I think you have to do it every year too. Um, and sometimes they also want to do if you're driving children. Obviously, you have to do um, MVR checks too, which can sometimes cost money. So. I understand and I get it. So, um, all right. If that's if there's nothing else, I'm going to hand it over to Tom, and Tom's going to go into some of the compliance requirements for smaller organizations for the Affordable Care Act. So, okay. If I could pop in uh, for a second here. If you guys do have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat feature. Um, today's session is also going to be recorded, so if you need to go back and listen to any parts of it, that would be great. Um, you can do that. And also the um, PowerPoint presentation will be available um, on the NEMA website afterwards, um, just to let you guys know that. So Tom, I will hand it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Davidson. Uh, I'm in the benefits area at Gowrie. I've been uh, working with Gary for about um, uh, 15 years, and we do uh, both individual uh, benefits insurance as well as group. Um, or we've got groups of from uh, two people up to uh, over a thousand. Um, we've probably got uh, 350 group clients. I'd say our sweet spot is um, in the range of from 20 to 75 employees. Um, and as Kristen says, we like to we we we've, we've we've kept our our smallness. We're a very sophisticated organization with access to lots of resources, uh, but uh, we uh, we concentrate on providing a high level of service. I like to say that we provide sophisticated um, services uh, solutions in a in a personal way. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk today not so much about the specifics of the Affordable Care Act, because the Affordable Care Act has now kind of been around for a while, um, and um, the changes that it brought about, uh, people have gotten kind of used to. Um, a lot of those changes are embedded in uh, people's uh, <clears throat> medical plans. And I'm assuming for this group that, that uh, 
um, most of you are uh, under 50 employees and fully insured. If you're over 50 or if you have some sort of um, uh, self-funded stuff, some of the things I'm going to say will be a little bit different, but for, for the most part, uh, it, you know, it applies across the board. And obviously, if anybody has any specific questions about what pertains to their specific situation, uh, I'd be happy to answer those uh, offline or at the end or whatever. Um, but embedded in the Affordable Care Act uh, are things like preventative care is, is offered at no uh, uh, charge, no copay, or no coinsurance. It's included in the premium. Uh, dependents can be left on uh, uh, a parent's plan up until age 26, regardless of uh, student status. Uh, there are no lifetime limits. Uh, there are no pre-existing uh, 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 exclusions, pre-existing uh, pre condition exclusions, um, and uh, certain certain things have to be provided to the employee uh, on a communications basis. Um, this first slide just says we've if, if people have questions about the Affordable Care Act, there's lots of stuff that can be provided, legislative bulletins. Step-by-step uh, -step, uh, breakdowns and guidance for uh, each individual state, um, uh, different reference material, and, and, and different calculators. But I don't think that that's going to affect uh, most of you all. Um, the good thing is that most of what is required under the Affordable Care Act uh, is already built into much of the documentation and. and uh, communications that you already get from your uh, carriers and any TPAs or other vendors that you uh, might use. Um, all of the plans that are being offered uh, in each state are ACA compliant and the language that is required to be uh, incorporated uh, in, the, in the plan certificates is, is automatically done by the carrier. The key is um, to have all of that stuff in one spot and have it accessible to your employees. We are seeing increased um, audits uh, around the ACA compliance issues, um, and there's also um, increased audits on stuff not related to the Affordable Care Act, uh, simply because it's now an opportunity to do it. Most audits are triggered by a disgruntled former employer uh, employee uh, going to an employment lawyer, um, and that employment lawyer in turn requesting uh, certain verifications that, that you are in compliance. Uh, the other uh, source of uh, an audit might be uh, something that shows up in a, in a 5500 filing. For most of you, you're not filing 5500s on medical or other welfare type plans, but you are filing them if you have a 401k. You're not filing on uh, normal welfare plans because I'm assuming that most of you don't have over 100 participants. But for a 401, a 401k, you, you have to fill a 5,500 regardless of the number of participants. Uh, most 401k vendors are pretty good about the compliance side of things. Uh, so I'd say the main worry that would uh, trigger an audit would be a disgruntled employee. Um, so again, most of the stuff that you have to do to be compliant with the ACA you have, but um, you should gather it and have it in a location, in a file, so if you do get audited, uh, you can demonstrate what you've got and you, can, and you can show them your plan documents. And there's no strict definition of what uh, needs to be included in plan documents, but you should include uh, the summary of benefits and coverage, which should be provided by your uh, carrier. Any other um, uh, summary of uh, plan, uh, plan features that the carrier provides to you. And in particular, any communications that you provide to your employees so that you can show them that you offer them health care and uh, outline exactly what, it, what they had to do to get it. Um, a couple of things, four in particular, that are not um, uh, done if you're not paying specific attention to it uh, are the following. The first is the initial or general COBRA notice. Most people think that the initial COBRA notice 
is the notice that you give uh, a, an employee a termination when they become eligible for COBRA. Uh, in fact, you're supposed to give a notice, um, well, I'm going to get into the details in the next slide. The other thing you're supposed to do is a notice of health care exchange, um, Medicare Part D creditable coverage, and then something called a summary plan description. Um, the initial COBRA notice is something that you give to somebody when they initially enroll in your health care. It's got to be provided to them within 90 days of, of them enrolling, and it simply states that should the occasion arise where, where they need to be offered COBRA, they will be offered COBRA. You can put it in your employee handbook. You can, in, you can put it in your summary plan description, which I'm going to talk about in, a, in, a, in I think, the next slide or so. Um, but it is, it's not something that they're going to come and close you down for, but it is something that could, that could generate a, a, a fine if, if you're not compliant with it. And the more of these things that you comply with in advance, uh, the better you can uh, demonstrate to the Department of Labor that you're making a bona fide effort to be in compliance and, and you know, if you're cooperative with them, they'll be cooperative with you. With you. Um, the second thing is the notice of health care exchange. Uh, everybody was supposed to have given all their existing uh, employees a notice uh, of the existence of uh, health care, uh, public health care exchanges in October of 2013. It simply is a notice that lets your employees know that of the existence of the exchange and they can go check it out. Um, what people um, were finding have tend to forget to do is to provide that same notice to all new hires. And they're supposed to be provided that um, within 14 days of their start date. Um, in the notice of exchange, there's also a um, a sheet that allows you to say that you are whether or not you are offering affordable health care, um, and you're doing your uh, employees a favor by letting them know that. If an employee goes on to the exchange and answers uh, the question uh, that, that and tells the exchange that they were not offered affordable health care, they could qualify for a subsidy, and if subsequently it uh, is found out that in fact they were offered affordable health care, um, they could be liable to pay back all of that subsidy. So uh, it's, it, you're doing your employee a favor if, if going into that you're telling them that look, we are offering you affordable health care um, so that they're not tempted to, to, to check the uh, off the box that says they're not offered it and then subsequently have to uh, pay any subsidy back. Because they're not going to catch them uh, right away. They're probably not going to catch them after year one. It may be two years that that will take it to to catch up to them, and they may have to pay back two years worth of subsidies, and may not have the resources to be able to do that. Um, generally, we find uh, for employer groups that are offering health care uh, that is affordable, um, employees will do better on the group's health plan than they will on the exchange health plan. Um, the other thing that you're required to do on an annual basis is uh, issue a notification as to whether uh, the prescription drug portion of your medical uh, coverage is uh, uh, creditable uh, as far as Medicare Part D is concerned. And basically, it just states whether your prescription drug program is as good or better than Medicare Part D. Um, you're supposed to issue that notification to all employees that are Medicare eligible or who have dependents that are Medicare eligible. Uh, we advise people, we advise groups to just give it out to everybody because it's hard uh, for an employer to know whether an employee has uh, a Medicare eligible dependent or not. So we say to cover your base, just issue it to everybody. Um, and the carrier, your carrier is supposed to issue a notice to you every year as to whether your coverage is creditable or not. Um, so you, that gives you the knowledge you need as to how to issue that notice to your employees. Um, and you're also required to go online and disclose to the CMS, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, as to whether your plan is creditable or not. 
Um, the notice uh, given to each individual is supposed to be done generally by October 15th of every year, and the deadline to disclose to CMS is uh, uh, March 1 of every year. Um, and there are uh, specific forms that you can use to issue, the, issue those uh, notices. Uh, your current broker can help you with those, or if you'd like to um, drop me a line, we can, we can send you the stuff that you need there. So those three things I just talked about are kind of little picayune things that are more of a pain than anything else. Um, oh, one more thing on the Medicare Part D coverage. The, the reason why you want to do that, why, the, why it's helpful for you to do that, not only is it required, but if by any chance your, your prescription drug coverage is not creditable, uh, like the case with some groups that have uh, HSAs with, deduct with deductibles of over $2,500, your coverage is likely not creditable. What that means is if somebody becomes, when they become Medicare eligible, if they don't sign up for Part D right away and they want to stay on your plan for a couple of years, they're going to have to pay a penalty when they do decide to go on Medicare, when and if they do decide to go on Medicare, they're going to have to pay a, a higher premium for their Part D. Um, so some people uh, opt to sign up for Part D right away to avoid that uh, increase. Um, and so you're doing your uh, employees a favor, especially if your uh, plan is not creditable. If it is creditable, then it's no harm, no foul, but you're still required to issue that notice. Um, the next thing uh, is, is something that very few groups are in compliance with, and that is the um, every ERISA uh, benefit plan, which includes medical plans, dental, life, disability, and 401k, is supposed to have something called a summary plan description on those plans. And it is the main vehicle for communicating plan rights and obligations to participants and beneficiaries. When the DOL does an audit, this is the first thing they're going to ask for, and 95% of groups out there don't have them uh, done. Um, and as I said before, if you go through an audit, what they're looking for is your ability to prove that you adequately communicated uh, how people access the fits uh, that you're offering. And this is the most important document uh, in describing that. Um, most people think that the summary plan description is the, uh, is the benefit summary that uh, the carriers give them when they first enroll, and it, it is not. It, inc it includes that, or it can include material from that, but it also needs to include uh, certain ERISA uh, language. Um, and it, it, you know, if you guys work with a, uh, an, uh, uh, a corporate lawyer or um, you know, some other advisor, they should be aware of this and be able to advise you on it. If, if you're not having luck finding out about this, uh, you can go online. Uh, you can also drop us a line and we can, we can tell you more about it. Um, but it is, it is something that all uh, ERISA plans are required to have. If you have a medical plan, you, you need this summary plan description. Um, we have been putting uh, groups that don't have these and would like to uh, get one in touch with uh, a lawyer that we use. Uh, for the simplest document, um, he charges, I think it's a, uh, somewhere about $875. You can do a wrap document that uh, wraps more than one plan into this document. Uh, and depending on the number of plans, you could spend up to maybe 1,200 uh, bucks on, on doing this. What some small employers are doing, if, if, if you get audited and, and uh, the summary plan description is requested, you have up to 30 days to provide it. Some groups are saying, well, I'll wait and get audited, uh, and when I get audited, I'll work on producing, you know, making the document. Uh, you know, technically you can do that, 
uh, although you're supposed to have the document on file and make it available to your uh, em employees. Uh, and I think if you get audited, you may have a lot of other pressing things that you're worried about in that 30-day period to, to have to worry about this in advance or, you know, at that time. So we recommend that you look into uh, at least beginning to prepare this document in advance. Um, you can go online to something called erisapro.com, uh, and I think that they have uh, various templates that you may be able to use. Um, if you contact us, we can provide you with a, a template document. You can take a shot at doing it yourself. I, I would advise uh, in the final analysis to have um, somebody with a legal mind look at it. Um, but that summary plan description is, is, is something that is required of all ERISA plan documents, and probably 95% of the groups out there don't have one. But it is the first thing in an audit uh, that they're going to ask for. Um, beyond that, there's all kinds of stuff that has been associated with the Affordable Care Act and uh, outside of the Affordable Care Act. If you have specific questions on stuff, we can provide you with all kinds of compliance checklists. We can provide you with toolkits that um, uh, describe in greater detail uh, what some of the requirements uh, are. Uh, your existing brokers ought to be able to uh, provide you with the same sort of thing. On this slide, there's a timeline. The timeline is we've already passed most of the uh, time hurdles uh, associated with the ACA, so I don't know that that's of that much value anymore. Um, but certainly if there are questions, I would ask your current uh, broker, um, or you're welcome to call us. I, I promise I won't try to sell you anything, but I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, I'm going to turn it. Uh, if, if, before I go, are, are, does anybody have any questions that I can help with? Nope. Can anybody hear me? We're actually a quiet group today, so <laughs> there's a <laughs> lot of information to process right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I went over things fairly quickly. Um, again, if, if, if people would like to drop me a, a note with specific questions, I'd be happy to respond to it. And I'll turn things back over to Kristen right now. Thanks. And Tom will be, still be here when we have the general question time. Um, I'm going to do, DNO is usually something, a place where we have the most questions. So I'm going to do my slides um, as quick as I can so we can uh, focus in on that if that's what people want to talk about. Um, Directors and officers policies are something that if you're a nonprofit, you should 100% have one. Um, and even if you think you have some statutory protections, that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, oh, hold on real quick. Um, there's a quick question. Um, how does offering affordable care affect subsidy payback if business policies are implemented after they are already enrolled? Uh. This is from Paula. Where do you see that? Sorry, everyone. I just want to make sure while we were on the topic of um, the Affordable Care Act. Um, if, if, uh, I, I think the question is asking me if, is, uh, if somebody's already on the exchange and gotten a, a subsidy, um, and then the group uh, offers insurance, um, the the um, th that is that is a life event. If uh, if the employee chooses he the exchange and onto the group plan, um, and but I think that since he signed up uh, and gotten the subsidy before the group offered affordable health care coverage, his subsidy will be okay for the time being. Uh, come next open enrollment, it would be different though. All right, thank you, Paula. Um, okay, so directors and officers coverage is, like I said, everyone should have one if you're a nonprofit and you have a board of directors. Um, it typically comes in two parts. There's the, the first vein is directors and officers traditional, which is uh, protects the organization against allegations of mismanagement, um, uh, making poor decisions, uh, 
wasting the, the organization's resources. Um, so these are kind of corporate Enron type scandals that hit the news. We don't see a ton of them on my side. Um, and what I see are claims in the second vein of DNL, which is employment practices liability coverage, um, which that is is becoming more and more of a problem for nonprofits because this these are allegations of discrimination, civil rights type violations. Think. Um, uh, gender discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, racial discrimination, wrongful termination, harassment. Um, a stat from the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance group says, and this probably is kind of old actually, um, but one in 25 nonprofits will have a DNO claim filed against them in any given year. And the average cost to defend a claim is about $35,000, which that sounds about right to me even if there's uh, no settlement, just to, to hit, just to address the claim and hire a lawyer and things like that. Um, and another statistic that I saw is one out of every 10 DNO claims will cost at least $100,000 to resolve. That also sounds right to me. Um, insurance companies are not going to fight these to the death. Insurance companies want to get rid of these things. Even if you think that a, claim, a DNO claim like, and we'll go to the next slide. Even if you have a an employee who is just a, a terrible person, you have reams of paper about how awful they were at their job, and you finally fire them, and they come back to you alleging you fired them for, you know, insert civil rights type violation here. Um, the insurance carrier is not going to uh, go to the death for you to fight it. They are going to settle it. Even if it's groundless, even if it means a lot to you, you usually give that right away in, by having a DNO policy. So unfortunately, that's just, unless you want to fight it yourself and not get your insurance carrier involved, that's what we're looking at. Um, we're finding ETL claims um, are becoming more prominent also because nonprofits do work with a vulnerable population and your clients can also see you under the employment practices liability policy. Um, it's a subset called third party claims. I see a lot of these with my social service organizations who, um, you know, domestic violence shelters, homeless shelters, things like that. You didn't have a bed for me because I was, you know, white, black, Hispanic, et cetera, you rejected me because I was this or that, um, and they're coming after nonprofits more and more. And I don't mean to be kind of a downer about it. Um, unfortunately, this is just kind of how these things look in reality. So I hope no one takes offense that I'm kind of talking about it like that because this is just how it is, unfortunately. Um, and there's some claim scenarios right there. And say you're a historic house that has an ADA, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You don't have to comply because your building meets the standard and you don't need to put a wheelchair ramp in. That doesn't mean you can't get sued for not having one. Um, again, the plaintiff might not get anything, but you still need to hire an attorney. So, um, <clears throat> and this is what, um, John, I see your question, and that's going to, my bottom line addresses your uh, mass law question, which I will um, read to the rest of the forum when I get to the bottom of the slide. Um, employee, directors and officers' policies become in all shapes and sizes. Um, there's a lot of great nonprofit carriers who have great forms, but that being said, there are some things you want to review with your broker. Um, again, that our defense costs inside or outside the limits. That's really important in a DNO and EPL policy. Those legal fees will eat up any settlement, and uh, your umbrella typically cannot sit over your DNO policy. So if that limit gets eaten up, you don't really have any recourse except your own funds. Are third-party suits excluded? That is, if your clients or your patrons, guests, what have you, if they come and try and um, come after you, sometimes these are excluded under DNO policies. So look for that exclusion. I find it more and more as of late. Costs a lot of money to add it back in. Usually um, carriers will try to exclude third party suits if you have one pending currently. Um, is there a sublimit for wage and hour claims and are they excluded entirely? Wage and hour claims are becoming a big deal. 
Um, it used to be just a class action lawsuits against corporations for wage and hour claims. And what a wage and hour claims are, um, it's an assertion by an employee that the employer failed to pay overtime wages owed to the employee. Um, they're almost always excluded. Some DNO policies are built in sublimits. So if you say you have a million dollar occurrence, three million dollar aggregate for your DNO, um, you're usually seeing $100,000 for the wage and hour claims unless they're excluded entirely. So that's something to look for and just to watch out for. Um, look for a broad definition of who's an insured. Should cover everyone, including volunteers. And full prior acts coverage. You want to look to see if your policy has full prior acts. That means it's a policy with no retroactive date. A retroactive date is a date pretty prominently displayed on that deck the declaration page, and that means that if you have a retroactive date, that policy is not going to pay for any claim that came before that retroactive date. So it depends on the statutory limitations for some of for when you can file these things. But um, if you have full prior acts coverage, you don't need to worry about those dates. It will cover any claim that happened even before you had a DNO policy. So um, Philadelphia is typically really good about offering this. Um, but, wow, that's a typo. <laughs> that's embarrassing. Bottom line, do not rely too heavily on immunities and limitations provided by state laws. And this is John's question. Is Massachusetts law provides protection, how, and nonprofit attorneys recommend that it's not needed. How do you decide? Um, DNO is not as expensive as it used to be uh, to get. Um, probably the minimum amount of protection you would need, which would be a million occurrence, three million aggregate, in our opinion. Um, if you don't have a ton of employees, if you're a pretty small organization, and if you do not have any claims, I'm seeing most policies start at about $1,000. So yes, a statutory defense may prevail, but you still need to find a, you still need to hire an attorney to get to that point, and who's going to pay those legal fees? So at the end of the day, a director's and officer's policy, in my eyes, is to cover legal fees and any resulting settlement, but mostly legal fees. And, and these things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, I've got clients who have six employment practices liability claims in one year. And it, they were totally legitimate what happened um, on the executive director side. It was sort of a cleaning house situation. She spoke to several employment attorneys, um, had lots of files on these people, and they all still came after her, and it all still cost a lot of money. And uh, so it's just, to me, it, it seems like a pretty low cost in terms of buying one and at least having that protection in the back of your mind. Even if you know you might win the day, it's in one, two, three, four years. I mean, think of you know, how much it costs to pay an attorney just for an hour. So I, in my opinion, I think it's just a, a good thing to have. And, Honestly, if you don't have a, a DNO policy, it's very hard to attract pr more prominent people to your board. Politicians are going to want to see it. Um, well, no business people are going to want to see it. So, because if you don't have one, you can go. The person can stretch to the personal assets of the boards of directors and the executive directors. So, it's it's something to at least look into. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say, if you do want a directors and office officer's policy and you don't have one, um, expect to fill out uh, an application and also to provide copies of your employee handbook, your harassment policies, and your financial statements. Um, it's not just the app. They want to see um, how solvent you are as well. So that's kind of it for our, our part of the presentation. I know we went over, so if there's any questions that anyone wants to ask, um, or if you want to ask offline, this is just kind of some verbiage about gallery and what we do for our museum clients. Um, and I did want to leave everyone with, uh, and I know Tom does something similar, I audit existing policies for, for museums all the time, meaning I come in, I take a look at what you have, and this is of no cost to anyone. Um, and it's a good way to see if your current exposures mirror what you actually have. And it's a good exercise if you have it with your agent recently, or if you're maybe doing something new, um, or if you haven't gone to bid in some time. So we do that. We kind of prepare like an executive summary and present it. So it's that's an option to everyone. 
if you'd like to, to talk about it. Um, but if anyone has any questions, you know, please feel free to either type it right now or um, email Tom and I, and we'd be happy to, to answer them. Oh, and also our session at NEMA is all about directors and officers. It will be 100% NL and EPLI. So if, if people are going to the conference in November, we will be getting very um, in-depth about it and bringing on other, not just insurance people, but some other um, individuals who have a claims expertise in DNL so they can kind of bring some real-life examples. Well, thank you, Kristen and Don. I mean, Tom, um, for your presentation. There's definitely a lot of food for thought there. Um, I know I'm taking quite a bit away too. As huh. I mentioned earlier, um, this will actually be on the NEMA website, so you guys can um, view the PowerPoint presentation there. If you have any follow-up questions, definitely let Gallery. Um, they are there to help. Um, Kristen, do you guys have any like? For. <laughs> um. Yes, I know it's very overwhelming, and I hope it wasn't too doom and gloom, especially the last part, because you know it's hard to 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 share real life claim scenarios and not get kind of negative, unfortunately. So I hope that no one thought that. No, but it's what's needed. Um, so I just want to invite everybody to our next one, uh, which will be May 27th, and it's seven ways to stay organized at work with well Marilyn Weiss Kruchink. Um, looks like an interesting one, uh, something a little bit different from today. But um, thank you again to the gallery group for presenting, and thank you for everybody for joining us for the April lunch with NEMA. Thank you.